A reading from Jonathan Edwards' sermons on the parable of the ten virgins. A warning to professing Christians who slumber and sleep because a bridegroom tarries. Matthew 25. Judgment is the less realized amongst men because it is that which we have heard from our infancy and have never yet seen. It is that which has been preached to the world age after age, but never has yet been accomplished. So it is a difficult thing to realize death. For though we all rationally know that we must die, not only the word of God, but universal experience teaches it. Yet death, being that which we have often heard of, and never yet have been the subjects of, or known anything about by experience, and looking on it as nothing very nigh, it is hard to have a realizing view and sense of our own mortality, and to have imposed upon us as a thing in which that we must die. Death and the grave, and especially the eternal judgment that follows death, when we think of it with application to ourselves, is ready to be covered with a kind of mist, so that they look at things as very distant and scarcely appear as things that are real. Ungodly men, because they haven't been yet called to an account by the judge, and that eternal punishment they have heard so often of has not already come upon them, are ready to think it never will come. They have often heard the threatenings of God's awful displeasure against such as they, and have been told how angry God is with them, but they don't see tokens of God's anger, they don't feel anything of it. Things go on smooth and well with them year after year. God keeps silence. All things are still and quiet. So they don't realize it, that God is so angry with them as they have heard. They have heard often of the dreadful misery of hell, and how that they that were in such a condition as they were every day in danger of it. But yet it doesn't count. They don't find that they are disturbed or molested in their ways, but that they are left alone. So they are led to call it in question whether there be any such thing as hell. Psalm 10, verse 6, He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. Psalm 50, verse 21, These things you have done, and I kept silence. You thought that I was altogether such an one as yourself. But I will reprove you, and set them in order before your eyes. And the godly, as they have remains of a spirit of unbelief, so the spirit in them nourishes itself from the delay of Christ's coming. Spiritual and eternal things sometimes appear as real and certain to them, and they have a lively sense of their reality, and when they have, they are not asleep. But when they slumber and sleep, unbelief prevails. At such times they don't realize, as they should do, how that they must stand before the judgment seat of God. If they did, it would have a great tendency to rouse them out of their slumber to make them more watchful and put them upon diligence to prepare to give account of themselves to God. The reward that Christ has promised his disciples for their diligence and a service appears less real to them in their sleepy frames, for it's being looked on as at a distance. Things at a distance are less affecting than things that are looked upon as very nigh, and that, though they are judged to be as certain, the carnal unbelieving hearts of natural men, and a carnal part in the hearts of the godly are ready to put Christ's coming at a great distance, because he has not come yet. We are all exceeding prone to that, to look on death and judgment as remote things. It looks remote to persons when they are young, remote from themselves, though it doesn't seem to them to be remote from others. When young persons look on those that are old, Death looks very near to them, but yet when they come to be old, still death doesn't look near. Still there is this old disposition to keep death at a distance. And things that are looked upon as distant don't affect and move persons as things that are beheld near at hand, though they are not indeed of the less importance. Much of things that we view at a great distance in the air look little in comparison of what they do when they are near. The further they are removed, the less and less they look, till at last they vanish out of sight, though our reason tells us that they are as big as when we were near them. 
And thus, putting judgment and punishment at a distance, wicked men encourage and embolden themselves in sin. Ecclesiastes 8 verse 11 Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Amos 6 verses 3 to 6 You that put far away the evil day, and cause the seed of violence to come near, that lie upon beds of ivory, and stretch themselves upon their couches, and eat the lambs out of the flock, and the calves out of the midst of the stall, that chant to the sound of the vial, and invent to themselves instruments of music, like David, that drink wine in bowls, and anoint themselves with the chief ointments, but they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. And so the godly themselves, through their infirmities and carnality, and in their slumbering frames, are not so much moved by the promises of future rewards, for they're looking on them as at a distance, and so are not so engaged in pressing towards them. Through their infirmity, they are in this like children, who will be much more moved by the promise of an immediate reward than one to be bestowed many days hence. From Christ's tarrying, they are ready to look on their present things as of long continuance, and so to set their hearts on them. Christ, before this tarrying and delaying his coming, they are ready to put his coming at a distance, and the more distant Christ's coming appears, of the longer continuance will the things of this world appear, and so of the greater value and importance will they appear, and this proves a temptation to them to set their hearts on things of this world, and so to be lulled to sleep with them, having the heart ever charged with the cares and pleasures and vanity of this life. If Christ's coming was apprehended to be very nigh, either by death or the last judgment, men would not think it worth their while to be much concerned about these things, since that they must soon have forever done with them. But Christ deferring his coming... They are ready to treat these things as if they were everlasting things. And setting their hearts much on them, they very much engross the affections and concerns of the mind, and having stupefying influence on the soul to make it dead to the things of religion and involve it in a great deal of sin. For the apostle has taught us that the love of the things of this world is the root of all evil, First Timothy 6.10. Men by this means, being inordinately engaged after the pursuits and honors of the world, become covetous and proud and contentious and envious, and pursuing after pleasures, they become licentious and very sensual. This exceedingly stupefies the heart. The godly, when they are in their slumbering frames, they look on their future inheritance as at a distance, and so don't think so much of that. But their present possessions they are ready to think of long continuance, and so are ready to have their hearts taken up with them, which involves them in many snares. And lastly, this is a temptation to them to delay and put off a preparation for Christ's coming till hereafter. They have lived hitherto, and Christ has not come yet, and they are ready to hope for time enough hereafter. Thus natural man delay and put off getting an interest in Christ. And the godly are ready to delay to stir up themselves to get into an actual preparedness, hope to be in better frames before they die, would not have death come and find them in such frames as they are in now. We may suppose that both the wise virgins and foolish, when they began to give way to a sleepy disposition, hoped that they should wake up again time enough before the bridegroom should come. They had waited so long, and he had not come that they began to think it would be a long time before he came, and thought they might have a convenient time to sleep, and yet be ready when he actually came. Thus foolish virgins put off buying oil for their lamps, like natural men seeking grace, who delay and put off seeking. Hypocrites, and those that have false hopes of their state, delay that thorough examination of their state, even as the foolish virgins delay trimming their lamps before the coming of the bridegroom. If those that have had false hopes expected soon to appear before him, whose eyes are as a flame of fire, they would not rest in those things that they do now. They could not be quiet and easy in such sorts of signs and evidence as now they are. They would not think themselves so safe as to dare to go to sleep, 
the godly would not so neglect themselves. They would be more thorough to obtain sensible and clear experiences and lively evidences of their good estate, and so seek after assurance. They would not put off trimming their lamps till hereafter, but would do it daily as continually expecting the bridegroom. Application The use that I would make of what has been said under this head is to warn both godly and ungodly against so ill an improvement of the bridegroom's tarrying. And to enforce this warning, I would offer some things to your consideration. First, consider that you will at last see that this is a foolish improvement of Christ's tarrying. There is nothing got by giving way to the inclination of the flesh to slumber and sleep while the bridegroom tarries. Many thousands and millions have lost their souls by it. The foolish virgins, if they had not spent the time in sleep, but on the contrary had been watchful, and had gone in season to buy oil, and had kept awake to keep their lamps burning, might have been ready, might have escaped that misery, and might have had the same privilege with the rest of the virgins. And what losers the godly will be by it will be seen more fully under the next head of discourse. By slumbering and sleeping while the bridegroom tarries, you will make it a harder work to repent. Second, consider that now Christ's coming may seem distant to you. Yet when the time comes and you look back, it won't seem distant from the present times. The time of Christ's coming often seems very distant when persons look forward before it has come, but never when it looks back after it has come. Then the time it will appear as it is but a very short time. Then you will see the truth of what Christ has said concerning his own coming. Revelation 22, verse 20. He that testifies these things saith, Surely I come quickly. And also of what the apostle has said. Philippians 3, 5. The Lord is at hand. James 5, 9. The judge stands before the door. Then, when you come to look back on the time past, between that and the present, how short will it appear, even as it were a dream, a tale that is told, a moment, a mere nothing, a spate that has slipped away before you were aware. Then you will see that time to be so short that you will be convinced that you had no time to sleep in it. Then you will see what need there was, that all of it should be spent in the most watchful diligence. Then you will be as it were between time and eternity, and then will the whole of time that has passed with you before Christ's coming appear as nothing. Third, consider that you don't know how soon the bridegroom will come. It is an unreasonable way of arguing that the corrupt carnal hearts of men fall in two, that because they have often heard of Christ's coming and been warned to be prepared for it, and that notwithstanding he has not come yet, and that therefore his coming is at a distance, it in no wise follows. It is an inference that corruption and not reason draws from such premises. You know not but that the bridegroom is just now at the door, while you are slumbering, and many of you, without a drop of oil in your vessels and your lamps, totally gone out. Many have argued, as you do now, that because a bridegroom has tarried before, that therefore he will tarry yet a great deal longer, and so have given themselves time to go to sleep, and contrary to their expectation, the midnight cry has been presently heard. Before they have slept any long time, they have been woken up again with that solemn cry, and see that it was so indeed. Surely the proper and most rational improvement that you can make of this uncertainty of the time of Christ's coming is to be found always waking and always ready. This is the improvement Christ makes of it in conclusion of this parable in Matthew twenty-five thirteen. Wash therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man comes. And the same he often makes of it elsewhere. Of the forty-second verse of the preceding chapter, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Fourth, this improvement of the bridegroom's tarrying is a most ungrateful improvement, and at Christ hitherto has tarried to give us opportunity to be the better prepared for his coming. It is an instance of his great mercy and long-suffering to sinners that he hasn't yet come to judge them, but has been waiting to be gracious, giving them a space to repent in, 
giving them opportunity to go and buy oil, so that when he comes they may enter in with him into the wedding feast. Second Peter 3, verses 9 and 10. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Sinners, therefore, in making such an improvement of Christ tarrying hitherto, are very ungrateful, as well as very foolish. When Christ stays to give them opportunity to prepare, and they instead of that improve it to be more and more unprepared. And so when the godly make this improvement of the bridegroom's tarrying, they are guilty of great ingratitude to Christ, for by this he gives them opportunity to be better prepared. Though they have some preparedness for his coming, yet by his tarrying they have opportunity to get in much better preparation for it, to get more grace more oil, and to meet the bridegroom with a brighter lamp. Let both sinners and saints amongst us be both warned from these things to rouse out of their slumber. There are many of you that are here present of both sorts that are now asleep. All you that have heard hitherto from the subject, and have not awakened, but are still going on slumbering. If you knew that the bridegroom was to come tomorrow, would it not rouse you? Would you not in many respects carry yourself very differently from what you now do? Then consider that you don't know but that it will be on the morrow, yea, in this very night. You that are Christless souls and unawakened and sleeping on the brink of hell, going on in ways of sin, consider that you know not but that this night your soul shall be required of you. Christ may come by an apoplexy or some such disease, and you may suddenly drop down dead, as many others have done. Or even you may die in your beds, and your sleep that you sleep this night may be your last sleep, out of which you shall never awake, but in hell. Yea, I would put it to you further, whether if you knew that Christ would come to call you to his judgment seat this year, you would live as you now do? Would you live so careless? Would you live so negligent and slothful, so worldly and carnal, if you knew? Why, then, consider how likely it is that there are some of you with whom it will be thus. Did those adult persons that have lately gone into eternity, did they know of it, or had they any notice of it long aforehand? What more signs had they of Christ's coming by night with respect to them than you have with respect to you? There is a next thing that is to follow, a next of the adult persons that are now present, that is, to go to his grave. He or she sits here somewhere amongst us. We don't know where to look for him. We know not in what seat or pew, but God knows him by name. He sees the spot where he or she sits. He knows how it is with him, whether he is a true Christian or a false one. He sees whether he is awake or asleep. He knows the frame of mind that he is now at this present time in and what he thinks while he is hearing this discourse. It may be he is one of those that is in a careless, slothful way, neglecting a soul. It may be he is one that has of late lived in some evil way. It may be he is one that has lived in some secret sin, filthy, forbidden pleasures, and gratifying some lust time after time in the dark, or very lately has so done, and it may be notwithstanding a special profession of religion. Very probably, if that person knew how soon Christ would come and call him to an account, he would be far from living as he now does, Matthew twenty four forty three. Know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have allowed his house to be broken up. Let us, everyone, seriously consider these things, and that the Lord would give all wisdom to make a good improvement of them. It is also to be observed that when true Christians slumber and sleep, the cry of the bridegroom's coming is like to be unexpected and surprising to them as well as to others. It is a cry at midnight to one as well as to the other. It is a sudden cry that wakes both out of sleep. And it was to both as a cry that wakes persons out of sleep at midnight is used to be, namely, surprising. I would particularly take notice what is implied in the expression of a cry at midnight. 
by which it appears that it is something surprising, and then in the second place show how it is a surprising cry to slumbering satans, as well as sinners. I would particularly take notice what seems to be denoted by it being a cry at midnight, by which it appears to be that which is surprising, and particularly two things are to be observed. That it is not only a voice or speech, but a cry that is made which signifies a loud and earnest voice, as occasioned by something of very great concern and importance. The word is always used in Scripture. There are several sorts of cries. There is a cry of lamentation, such as was in Egypt at midnight also, when there was not an house in which there was not one dead. And there is a cry of supplication, and there is a cry of complaint. So the cry of the sins of Sodom is said to be very great, Genesis 18.20. And so the cry of the children of Israel in Egypt is said to come up to God, Exodus 2.23. And there is a cry of warning and alarm as when fire breaks out, or when a people are suddenly beset by an enemy. But each of these sorts of cries intimates something of great concern and importance, and in a very earnest expression of it. So is this cry that we have an account of in this parable. Behold, the bridegroom comes. Go you out to meet him. It is a voice of warning and alarm, a loud and earnest voice, giving notice of something to the ten virgins of the utmost concern to them, and worthy greatly to move them. It is a cry at midnight, of which several things must be noted. It is a cry in a still time. The middle of the night is commonly a still, dead time, wherein there are not those noises that are in the daytime, a time in which man and beast are still and motionless, all things retired, and all locked up in sleep. A cry, therefore, is a more surprising at such a time, because it is a time in which noise is most unusual and most unexpected. It is a great deal more moving and affecting than it at another time. A little noise will be taken of in the dead of night that would not be taken at all notice of at another time. Those noises that are usual and that persons are not moved at in the daytime, if heard at midnight, would strike with great impression on the mind and waken the attention, but especially is a great and earnest cry surprising at such a time. This cry, spoken of in this parable, is in a still time, before it there was no noise. It comes suddenly. It comes all at once. There was no noise before that was a forerunner of it, to give warning of its approach. No resemblance of any such thing. The cry comes when it is a still time in men's own consciences, when conscience hasn't been much in warning of them. They have thought but little about anything of that nature. They have lately had no alarms of conscience to disturb them or make them uneasy. It comes when things are all quiet, when persons have been very much let alone. The cry of pastors has not been heard. If they have cried, their cry hasn't reached their hearts and consciences, so as to make it any other than a still time there. It comes often at a time when God has let them much alone. He hasn't called of late by the motions of his spirit, but all has been still and quiet and at a time when such a cry was not thought of, and if it had been thought of, would have appeared a more remote thing at that time than at any time. Who would all at once expect such a cry at a time when all was so still and quiet, and everything appeared so far distant from anything of that nature? Midnight is the time in which persons commonly have divested themselves of all care. In the daytime, persons' minds are commonly full of one care and another. There are many concerns that are busied about. Inconveniences and difficulties and dangers of one kind or another are then thought of, and a mind is exercised about them, and persons are contriving how to obtain this and that good that is needed, or to avoid this or that evil that they are exposed to, and those cares may hold in the evening. But midnight is commonly a time when persons have laid aside all those things. They have thrown by all care and business, and composed themselves to sleep. And therefore, such a loud, important, and earnest cry, calling for their utmost concern and attention, coming suddenly upon them, 
will be more surprising than in the daytime when the mind was devoted to care and business. The news of something that required care would not be so shocking, for then the mind was, as it were, readily prepared for care. The loins more ready girt, but at midnight all is relaxed, the loins ungirt, and the clothes put off. A sudden and great alarm at this time finds a man unprepared for it, and so it is surprising to him. Midnight is a time of darkness and most remote from light. It is a season in which there is none of the light of the sun, and is most remote of any time of night from it. Long after the sun has set and the evening's twilight has vanished away, and long before the sun rising and the appearance of the dawning of the morning, so this cry is made when it is a time of darkness with the ten virgins, or with visible Christians, when the ungodly are furthest from common enlightenings and convictions of spiritual and eternal things. And it sometimes comes at times in which true Christians are furthest from clear divine light, from a lively sense and clear apprehension of spiritual things. It comes when they are in dark frames, when their understandings are darkened through the deceitfulness of sin, and with their furthest from knowing the light of hope, or having the evidences of their good estate clear and bright, and furthest from having the comfortable sweet light of God's countenance. And therefore it comes at a time when it is surprising to them. Midnight is a season in which persons are commonly in their deepest sleep, in which they are not only asleep, but in their soundest sleep. And therefore it is a season when they have most of all forgot themselves, and are furthest from any care or thought, and is a time when to be suddenly awoken out of sleep with a loud and earnest and important cry will be more surprising to them. Midnight is a time in which things of that nature, that is declared by this cry, are wont least to be expected. The cry declares, Behold, the bridegroom comes. Midnight is the dead of the night, is a time in which it is very unusual for persons to travel to and fro. It is a not a time for traveling, but a time for rest. And it being very late in the night, the ten virgins for that reason did not expect the bridegroom. It being past the time when any such thing was usual, and that they thought they might safely venture to go to sleep, and being therefore so much unexpected, it was so much the more surprising. That cry, Behold, the bridegroom comes, go you out to meet him may wake saints out of sleep in a surprise, and that for three reasons. If it comes upon them while slumbering and sleeping, it comes upon them unawares. Even saints in such frames don't consider it and meditate it on it as they ought to do. Death and eternity isn't as familiar to them at such times. They are very much unacquainted with them. If they converse much with them in their thoughts, they would not be strangers and a midnight cry would be no surprise to the saints. At such times their thoughts are taken up about other matters, about worldly vanities, and so death and judgment are strangers to them, and they are put into confusion at their approach. And therefore Christ warns his disciples against these things. Luke 21, verses 34 and 35. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting, and drunkenness, and the cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. When they are found slumbering and sleeping, they aren't found in a disposition fitted for it. They are not in a good disposition and frame of mind to receive it, and to do what the cry calls them to do, namely, to go forth to meet the bridegroom. They are in a dark frame, a sluggish frame, a carnal frame. Such sinners are very far from being fitted for leaving all this world and going into an eternal world and going to appear before the judgment seat of God. They are like a man as he is at midnight, loins ungirt, his garments not about him, his body relaxed. They are being so unfitted it puts them into an hurry and confusion. When the saints are slumbering, they commonly don't know that they haven't been in a habitual preparedness for that cry, as they are far from an actual preparedness, so they haven't at such times clear evidences of a fundamental preparedness. Grace is not an exercise in them, and so not the evidence of it. 
Their minds are exceedingly clouded with corruption. They have their evidences very dim. This is signified by the lamps of the wise virgins burning dim. They arose and trimmed their lamps, so that they did not go out to totally as the foolish virgins did. They burn but very dim, and hence no wonder that they are surprised. It is dreadful to have that matter doubtful. It is dreadful to have a suspicion remaining in the time of that solemn cry. Application. Instruction. First. Hence it is no certain sign that persons are not converted that they are afraid of death. Second. If we see persons under fear and darkness on a deathbed, this is not a sufficient reason for us to conclude them natural men. The improvement we should make of it is to take warning. Use too may be of awakening to those that are asleep in their sins. Consider how dreadful that amazement will be first. How many things there will be to contribute to it. The greatness of that which the cry declares. The greatness of its importance to you is of immediate concern. It respects your whole interest. The welfare of body and soul to eternity. When you go to meet a great judge, you will be immediately before a being of infinite majesty, holiness, and justice. Consider your exceeding unpreparedness for eternity, whether your nature be not changed, the dreadful reigning corruption in your heart, the sins you have committed, the call slighted and opportunities lost, mercies alienated, your sins all unpardoned and with no Savior. Second, your terror and surprise will be without remedy. There will be no avoiding the judgment, no hindering it, though you cry to the mountains. The things that now quiet you will be no remedy then. There will be no worldly enjoyments. You will only have false hopes, no friends, and no time given you. Time and opportunity will be at an end. Third, your amazement that you will have then will be but the beginning of your amazement. Often wicked persons are in great amazement on their deathbeds, but this is but a beginning, and light in comparison. Sometimes they have such fear on a deathbed as makes them tremble and groan and cry out. They go from this world groaning and crying to God for mercy, but this is but a light thing in comparison of what will be at the day of judgment. That terror and amazement that is then begun will last to all eternity, but only in an immensely great degree. Application 3. Let the saints be hence exhorted not to slumber and sleep before the midnight cry. Let those that are asleep awake. Let others that are now awake remain awake. You have heard what you will be exposed to by it. There will be no security from it if you give way to a slumbering spirit. If you are slothful, or worldly, or unwatchful, you will only be saved as by fire, as when a man is waked at midnight with his house on fire and he is scarcely saved. Don't think there is no danger of this because you are converted. Consider three things first. What a pity it is that such persons as you hope you are should needlessly expose themselves to a surprise as this. Those that are in such a blessed condition that God has done so much for, and that of such a foundation laid for their comfort and rejoice in at such great expense, and by such a wonderful work of God as he has wrought in their redemption. What pity it is that such persons as those for whom comfort has been purchased at such a price should deprive themselves of comfort, and hide the foundation of their joy from themselves, and so expose themselves to fears and terrors. Second, how especially undesirable is fear and surprise at such a time as when that cry is heard, Behold, the bridegroom comes, or when they come to be in a deathbed and seem to believe in the world to go into eternity. Doubts and fears are undesirable at any time, but especially at such a time. For then above all times in the world will the saints need to have clear evidences of their preparedness and of the light of God's countenance. Doubts and fears on a deathbed will be more terrible at such a time than any other. Then will be a most important season, a season in which great work is to be done. It is a great thing to die, for then it will be a juncture in which all things with respect to the eternal state immediately to be determined will be resolved. Then will be a most important change. When the saints come to die, they will especially need clear evidences of preparedness. It is probably enough to grapple with a distemper on a deathbed, 
Death is terrible to nature, destroying the frame of the body before leaving all the world. Because surprise will be very unsuitable and improper for saints on such an occasion, it is a proper occasion of rejoicing to be saints, waiting to hear the midnight cry, then call to meet the bridegroom. It is an improper occasion for sorrow and distress, not proper for a wedding. It is not a suitable frame to meet a bridegroom in who is coming on a joyful occasion. Children of the Bible chamber should not mourn while the bridegroom is with them or on the news of his coming to be with them. It becomes a saint to long for the coming of his Lord and to say as Revelation 22 verse 20, even so come Lord Jesus, and to love his appearing. This is mentioned as a character of the saints in Second Timothy 4 verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. Surely it becomes saints especially to love it when nearest. Let these things be effectually with you to move all that have this hope in them to stir up themselves and to take heed, that let Christ come when he will, he may not find them slumbering, but watching with their garments on, with their loins girt, being diligent and laboring in all their duty, watching and fighting against all sin, and fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Jonathan Edwards, Parable of the Ten Virgins.